Hello, uh, welcome to MoPro week six. Um, my name is Owen, um, and that is Nick. Um, welcome to um, materialism. Um, so just a little bit of background. I'm from outside of Boston. I've been going to camp for, ooh, I want to say a little bit over 13 years maybe. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm from the West Coast, Washington State. Um, I am. I was a session three camper along with Owen. This is my first year as a staff member, and uh, I'm really excited to to get to going with you guys. Awesome, awesome. So let's start off with a quick little prayer. Um, I'll get I'll get get going right now. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we pray to you. We just ask that you guide us, you guide uh, the campers, and you you allow us to take in the information and understand it and use it to better our relationship with you, better our relationship with our family and our friends. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So to start off, um, uh, the best way to kind of understand, the, uh, so our, our main topic is materialism. Um, and the best way to kind of understand that as a whole is to kind of understand the Orthodox beliefs to start off with. So that's kind of what our first lesson is going to be about. Yeah. Um, so a, good way to start off with that is kind of understanding the difference between personal prayer and group prayer. Um, there's a great passage in Luke uh, chapter 14 verses 15 through 24 um, where he says, now when one of those who sat at the, the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were in, invited, "Come for all things are now ready." But they all, but but they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, "I have bought a piece of ground and I must go see and, and must go see it. I ask that you have me excused." And another said, "I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask that you have me excused." Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the, the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the, the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, master, it is done as, as you commanded and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and c compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of these, that, that uh, none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Um, so as a kind of like a summary of this passage that we just talked about or read, um, a man had a banquet. So like a big meal for all of his friends, but they all made like excuses of why they couldn't go. So he invited everybody to, to, to come in. So the, the, the people who are hanging out on the, the, the streets um, and a lot of the poor people and just said, everyone come in. And then there was still like a ton of room. So he didn't really want the people who kind of gave those excuses that they, um, that they couldn't come. He, so he didn't really want enough room for them. So um, he wanted everything to be filled. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so this is kind of a talk, or it, it's a parable, which is a story or a lesson about excuse makers. So kind of, um, so they they refused the invitation to uh, the the banquet. So for us as Orthodox Christians, we understand this as kind of addressing those who fail to pray, um, either personally or collectively as a group, um, especially uh, for the Eucharist or com communion. Um, so little time for prayer kind of means like there's not a ton of time for God. And we need to like our first step towards improving this is kind of recognizing our excuses and taking the first step towards improving our prayer attitude. Yep. So in first Thessalonians uh, five seventeen, it actually calls us to pray unceasingly. Uh, unceasingly means never ending. So praying never ending uh, is, seems kind of to us a little uh, almost impossible, but it's 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 not. Uh, my dad went to uh, Mount Saint Athos a couple summers ago. He actually met some uh, 
some great monks who he, he told me great stories about while they were sleeping, while they were working, while they're eating, you can hear them mumbling the Lord's Prayer under their breath. Uh, and they are so in tune with their prayer life and so deep into that life that, that like Owen said, it's not, it, it's actually a prayer attitude. It's, it's more of just, it's not just something that we say, it's something that we live. And so praying unceasingly is very possible. And so our challenge is to make prayer a natural part of our day. Instead of just using it as kind of a 911 call, kind of a, I'm in trouble, what should I do? I've done everything else. Oh, now let me pray to God. It's more of a, I'm praying to God every day for thanking him, for praising him, for asking him for intercessions, everything. It's almost as if Jesus was constantly right next to us, constantly with us. And we say it in the Orthodox Church all the time, Jesus is everywhere present in all things. And um, it's, tr it's true. I mean, he really is. And so he is with us through the Holy Spirit. He is with us all day, every day. And so praying unceasingly is as if we're praying with him constantly walking right beside us throughout our whole life. Um, and, so, and it, okay, go, sorry, go, go ahead. Right ahead. No, go right ahead. All right. Um, so if you guys were with us last summer, we, did, uh, we went out to the meditation trail. We talked a lot about unceasing prayer as well. Um, we kind of use the example of using your breath as a way to kind of work on it with um, you breathe in, Oh Lord, Jesus Christ, son of God. And then, and then you breathe out, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, we used the icons to kind of talk about it. Right. And uh, the, the different steps um, and a way of kind of connecting and being silent is a kind of good way to kind of like start off your, your journey towards unceasing prayer. Yeah. And that could be anywhere. I mean, while you guys are at home, I mean, I know, we say bring camp home all the time. And at camp, we're praying all the time. We're praying before meals, praying before morning program, at church twice a day. I mean, it's your entire life while you're at camp. Mm. And so the fact that we're not at camp this year, I know it's hurt me personally, and it's hurt a lot of people, uh, campers and staff included. Uh, but it's, it's not an excuse to uh, let our prayer lives diminish at all just because we're not at camp for those two weeks that – is kind of a reboot. Instead, I mean, anywhere you go, at home, on the school bus, before a game, before a test, during a test, I've prayed before tests and during tests many times. Um, but I mean, you can pray anytime, anywhere to yourself. It's, it's truly amazing. You can do it anywhere at any time. So that is, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we tend to think about uh, unceasing prayer as a lot more of a personal thing. But so to kind of to kind of differentiate between that and group prayer, uh, we kind of need to understand what it is to have both personal prayer and corporate prayer. Corporate is like a com community prayer. So, um, for example, that would be uh, in a liturgy at a church service, um, just praying in large groups. Um, so um, you can pr uh, so you should pray. Uh, at, at all times by yourself but there definitely is time set aside where we as a group as a community as the faithful come together to come pray um, as a group um, so there are special steps um, to prepare ourselves physically mentally spiritually before during and after entering church to pray um, and this could be either for personal prayer or for group prayer. Um, so the first one is as we approach the chapel or church, we should always make the sign of the, the cross in the name of the Trinity, calling upon the saints to quiet our hearts and to speak and pray through us. So actually having entered into the temple of the Lord, which is the uh, traditional name for what we call the church, uh, the oldest pious customs actually call ourselves to cross ourselves three times while making three matanyas, which is uh, leaning down, touching the ground, crossing yourself. And at each of those, saying the prayer of the publican, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is a prayer uh, that is a reminder to us that our behavior in church should resemble that of the publican. Uh, it, it says in the Orthodox Study Bible that we must flee the haughty and proud attitude assumed by the Pharisee that we should also say the Lord's Prayer when we enter the church. 
So these actions show our humility before our Lord and Creator, that we have come to seek forgiveness of our sins and that we are here to do God's will. Um, the third one is that we need to enter the Holy Temple quietly and rev reverently with the fear of God. So if you've ever been to camp um, and you've been to one of our liturgies with uh, B B Bishop Thomas, I know he's definitely talked to us a lot about making sure that we're quiet in church. Um, whether that be when we're getting up from a sermon and not necessarily making those groans and those, those noises when we're trying to stand up or whether it's when we first get into church and we're still kind of having those con conversations that we don't need to be having in church. Um, it's very important that we respect um, that we re re respect that we're in God's house and that it's that this is a like a set aside time for us to have a group our group prayer instead of um being like the normal part of every single day is kind of a set apart time for us to have this um because we're entering into the sanctuary uh where everything is kind of blessed and sanctified and where our lord uh is with us invisibly present uh because when one or two of us are called in uh his his name he's with them which is um that's from Matt, uh, Matthew eighteen twenty, I believe. Um, uh, so yeah, so we avoid making commotion when, when we enter church. That way, we're not disturbing others who might be 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 there, whether they're in the midst of their personal prayer before or after a service, or we're not interrupting um, the group service that could already be going on. Hopefully not, because we always get to church early. Because yeah. early is on time, on time is late. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so then imagine, so while we're in church, continuing on that, on that topic of while we're in church, the, the quiet, respectful manner that we should all be acting in, it's kind of, uh, I mean, we say that he's invisibly present there with us. And so imagine if you walked in there and he was visibly present with us. Imagine if you walked in and you saw Jesus Christ at the front of the altar. I mean, you wouldn't want to be wearing shorts, flip-flops, a tank top, being loud and disrespectful, you know? You'd want to be put together. You'd want to be respectful because it's, it's all, it really is God's house. Every church in America, every church in the world is God's house. And to show up there disrespectful is not just who are trying to you know, get into prayer and trying to uh, uh, pray to God, but it's disrespectful to, to God himself who is, who has given us these spaces, who has given us these communities to uh, reverent, to be reverent and uh, venerate him and, and pray to him. So it's just something to think about for sure To Every time you go to church, every time you come to a prayer, uh, just go with the utmost respect and the utmost dignity into those, into those settings. So another way that we show respect when we enter a church or a temple um, is we greet Christ, we greet the, the, the saints and we greet the angels. Usually we do this by reverencing uh, and uh, kissing the icons that we usually find when we enter a church. So usually when you walk in, there's usually um, some icons that are usually up front for, for, for you to reverence b before you enter a church. Most times you'll find um, the patron saint of the church. Um, I know my church, uh, St. George, we have a big icon of St. George right when you walk in that, that you can kiss to enter in. Um, I know at camp we have the, uh, I believe we have two. We have the one in the back when you enter into the side door, it's the Theotokos and, uh, the baby Christ, um, which is also known as the sweet embrace. And then in the front, it's usually dependent upon the feast day. I think sometimes we have different saints. Uh, other times it's like the transfiguration. Um, I know we do St. Elijah when it's his feast day during session three, um, and transfiguration during two i believe um, um yes uh and some general guidelines for when you are referencing an, an, an icon we usually want to stay away from the face area uh your go-to's are usually going to be the feet the hands uh an item that they might be holding but usually your first uh your first go-to is the feet um this is kind of a way of showing re respect um um, so, and then actually, as we enter the church, it actually, there's a, almost an order of the way that we are supposed to kiss icons um, and venerate the icons. So you always start with Christ. He is 
you know, he is the highest figure in our church. And so it is the most appropriate to kiss him. And then obviously the most appropriate to kiss next is the Theotokos. Um, and then after that, the patron saint of the church and any other icon is there. Uh, the, the ancient, um, Oh, what's the word? Tradition. The ancient tradition of the church is uh, to actually go around and kiss every single icon in the church. And I know at Saint, the St. Ignatius Chapel at camp, there's so many icons hanging around the church. Uh, but you walk in and you kiss the hands and the feet of Jesus and then the Theotokos and then any other icon you see. Um, yeah. And then if it is crowded, um, like it usually is at camp, or it, it might be at your, your home parish. Um, it is appropriate to only f physically venerate the icons next to the, 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 the door. So you're not wasting or not, you're not wasting, but you're not spending so much time and blocking other people from being able to come in and come venerate so that we can all join in prayer to, together. Exactly. Um, another way of kind of venerating things is we also uh, venerate um, the, the Holy Cross relics, uh, the, usually the gospel book um, and the ancient tra tradition for this is to make two of the matanyas that Nick had talked about earlier, which is kind of like the small half cross, prostration and, and cross. Uh, so you do two of those and you bend at the, the waist. You don't have to go all the way down, um, but you want to touch the, the, the ground with your, your fingers. Um, and then you come back up you make the sign of the, the cross and then you can kiss the object. Um, and then usually we do a third as we are walking away, which is like a quiet off to the side once that other people can come up and come then venerate. Um, so in kissing icons, it's proper, like Owen said earlier, to kiss the feet of the Lord, the hand of the Theotokos and other saints, but it is actually very wrong to kiss many places on the icon, uh, such as in the icon of St. George, such as in Owen's patron saint of his church and my, the patron saint of my church, you should never kiss the, the dragon on the icon of St. George, because we're not, we're not reverencing and venerating the dragon, which is the symbol of the devil in that, in that uh, icon, but it, kissing that icon on the dragon is, is improper. Kiss the feet or the hands of St. George. Um, and while on that subject, veneration is not to the icon itself. It's not to the piece of wood that is hanging in your church, but it is to the, the saint that is of that, that the icon is of, or to Jesus Christ who is on that icon, or to the Theotokos who is on that icon. Those icons aren't what we're venerating. Those icons aren't what we're, uh, uh, what we're praying to. We're praying to the saints that those icons are of. And so when we are venerating icons, just make sure that you're going into it wholeheartedly, you're going into it careful, you're going into it mindfully and not just haphazardly or careless uh, because it's, it's, not, it's not just a simple kiss, but it actually is very serious and it's a very uh, meaningful uh, movement to be doing. And so when only the head of a Christ or a saint is depicted, um, if there's no hands to kiss, if there's no feet to kiss, if there's no uh, uh, cross that they're holding or scroll that they're holding to kiss, it's actually proper to kiss the hair of the icon. Um, and then if there's a crucifix, you should always kiss the feet or the lower cross of the, uh, the lower bar of the cross. Um, and those are just the proper traditional ways to, to venerate the icons. Um, in addition, just so um, as, as a way of like pre preserving icons, um, I know a big thing, I think we talked about this at camp, um, but just as, as like a general ref, reference, girls, um, you're not supposed to really be wearing lipstick when you kiss an icon. I know a lot of people at my church, they usually kiss like their, their hands and then touch it if they are wearing lipstick, um, just so that it doesn't get on the, the, the icon itself or the, the, the glass so other people have to also like kiss on top of that um yeah so lipstick you're not really supposed to be wearing um um and then an, like a, an ancient custom that the the church does as well is we usually place a lighted candle in front of an, an icon that we want to pray in front of um so i know at, at my church personally 
we have two set up. We have one in front of the, the Theotokos on the Iconostas and then one in front of Christ on the Iconostas uh, that certain people come up and they'll put a prayer on. I know at school, I go to a Greek church where um, a lot of the older Greek, Greek ladies will like kind of like finger in like a, like, like a little prayer on the, the candle. So as the candle burns down, um, their prayer kind of goes up with uh, like in, in front of that icon, which is super yeah. cool. Um, so. Yeah. And those candles are actually, uh, they're kind of tokens of, because candles are fire, candles are, you know, so they're kind of tokens of warmth and sincerity of our prayer, kind of as a symbol of, you know, the purity of our faith, a sacrifice of offering. So we're giving something up um, for our prayer. And that is, uh, that's just the symbolic meaning behind those candles. Super cool. Kind of how you should physically act in church. Now there's, there's also a way that you should be thinking in church. Uh, you know, while you're, while you're in the Holy Temple, the, which is the actual theological name of our, of our churches, of our sanctuaries, is we should, we should behave with respect, like we've said before. Uh, it says in Psalm 33, 19, the Lord is nigh unto them that are, that are of a contrite heart. Uh, so it's speaking about the heart of, of the, uh, the person in church. We, we're not there to be thinking of earthly things. We're not there to be thinking of, what am I going to have for lunch after this? We're not there to be thinking of, I can't wait to play angle ball after this. But instead, you're there to be thinking about God. You're there to be thinking about uh, what you're praying, what you're saying, the, the prayers that the priest is saying. Uh, you're, you're there to be thinking about those things. And so uh, lift up your hearts. The psalmist David teaches us to bring the Lord glory due to his name, worship the Lord in his holy court. That's Psalm 28, 2. I'll repeat it. Psalm 28, 2 says, bring to the Lord glory due to his name, worship the Lord in his holy court. God requires us to show respect to his holy places and things. And so when he appeared to Moses at the burning bush and Moses approached somewhat near to him, he said, do not come near, put off your shoes from your feet. The place on which you're standing is holy ground. So every time you enter into that church, you're, you are entering into the heaven. You are entering into heaven, the house of God. Uh, so leave behind all the savers of earthly things. Leave behind everything that is on your mind about earthly things, about the next iPhone you want, like I said, the next meal you want, the next activity you want to do. Leave behind all of those things because in the end, none of those things matter. None of, in the end, none of those things matter. And church is the only thing you should be thinking about, especially while you're there. Especially right there, you should only be thinking about that. You should only be focused on that and give your whole heart and your whole attention to the church and to the task at hand while you're there. Um, and while that can be tough, like I, I, I know personally, sometimes I do struggle with having my full attention on a church service. A good way to get like kind of back into that is to kind of say um, the Jesus prayer a couple times, just to kind of get yourself refocused back in. Um, I know that I've told my cabins this at camp a bunch because I know I struggle with it personally. Um, so that's, that's always a good, uh, that, that, that always helps me to get refocused back, back in. But it is also important to note that when we are having like a group prayer, like a church service, it isn't really a time for us to be full, uh, not, it isn't really a time for us to be using a uh, prayer rope to have like our personal prayer because our group prayer isn't time for personal prayer. Our group time, our group prayer is for group prayer. It's time for us to pray as a community for larger things and to kind of show that we all have like the same mindset towards something versus after church or pre-church or not even like during church. Um, that's our personal time to, to, to pray, not this group time. Um, so from that, uh, we'll talk about the end of a service when we leave church. Um, we should pretty much leave almost, a, almost the, the same way that we enter a church, um, quietly with reverence, uh, prayerfully, we venerate the, the, the icons again. Um, and then a good prayer for when you're leaving church is St. Simeon's prayer. We say it every Vesper service, um, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast pre prepared before the face of all people, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So 
St. Simeon was this uh, very righteous guy. He was kind of a scribe in Alexandria, which is a big li library of the, the Roman times. Um, it burned down li later, but that's not very important now. Um, so he was charged with transcribing Isaiah, uh, which is um, the book about the prophecy of Christ's birth. And he got to the point where he was transcribing um, that a virgin shall give birth to, to Christ. And he's like, oh, this can't be right. So he goes to go put in um, a woman should, shall give, give birth to the, the Christ. And an angel comes, comes down, and he's basically instructed saying, nope, this is how it's going to be. And he's like, all right. He talked, to, so God kind of talked, talked, talked to him, and they kind of made this, this deal where he, he was going to live long enough to, to see Christ, and then he, he would die. So he basically lived, I think, a little over 100 years, which is insanely long for, like, that period of, of time. Um, and he was the high priest who saw Jesus at the temple when they brought him to uh, present him to the temple. And he said this prayer after he kind of held up Christ. And then he went and, and he died, um, which is super, like, it's, it's a super cool story um, that basically, like, he was allowed to have this super extra long life to be able to see Christ after, like, reading through a bunch of old scripture and stuff. So it's a great thing to say, like, after we're about to leave church. Um, um, if we talk about, like, now that we've seen the, 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 the light, which can be interpreted as, like, the service that we just participated in, like we, we, we communally experienced like a piece of heaven. Um, and we, it's our job to kind of go out into the world to depart in peace and kind of spread that, you know, um, not necessarily through words, but like St. Francis of Assisi says, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. So kind of like use, use our actions, be a good role model to kind of show that. Yeah. Um, so we have a quick activity for you guys. Um, I want you, uh, we want you guys to think of, or to either think or try to find a, a new story and try to think of um, positive and negative news that invite prayer, such as like a national d disaster, personal tragedies, marriage announcements, human interest stories. Um, and then I want you guys to kind of brainstorm uh, what type of prayer you guys think would be most appropriate for that, whether that be um, uh, a praise, like, like uh, the, the, the Psalms are praises to God, it's like praising God for the, this, this wonderful thing. Whether you guys think it should be uh, like a Thanksgiving prayer where you're, you're thanking God for something, um, a supplication, which is like making a request to a certain saint or to, to intercede with God or just making a straight Sub supplication to God, um, which is like asking him for something. Um, or maybe it could be like a confession or an intercession, which is praying for other people. Um, so we, we want you guys to kind of brainstorm this and, um, yeah. And so as this is, we're, as we're talking about kind of praying unceasingly, you can kind of see, I mean, if you grab a single newspaper or even a single page of a newspaper, you guys can see just how, Everything that you see on there that is probably just going to be your local newspaper, everything that you see on there is going to warrant some kind of prayer, either a thank you, either a, or, or, a, or a please intercede for this person, or a I'm just praying for the well-being of this person, um, or a, I'm sorry that I've been doing this. There's so many different types of prayers and so many things going on in the world that, that warrant prayer. Uh, Praying unceasingly isn't that far out of the picture. Uh, and I think you guys will see that as you go through this, as you guys go through this activity. Absolutely. Um, so why don't you guys pause the video now, um, kind of try to do this, uh, and then come back once, once, once you're all done. So you can hit pause now. Welcome back. Um, I hope you guys had a good time with the activity. Um, um, hopefully you were able to kind of figure out what kind of prayer you guys think would go along with that new story. I think it's also important to un understand that there might not just be one certain kind of prayer that you think would go well with a certain story. It could be multiple. It could be kind of like a mixture of all, all those, those options, you know, 
like it could be like a mix of like a prayer of, of, of a praise and a prayer of thanks 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 thanksgiving where you're kind of like thank you so much for this um this is a wonderful thing that you've made or uh, a mix of like a, su- a supplication where you're kind of requesting something as well as like an, in- an intercession where you're praying for another person um so yeah so from there it's also very so it's very important that if we don't fully understand what we believe as orthodox christians it could be very difficult for us to defend our faith when it can be challenged um so to kind of exemplify this we're gonna have you guys do another activity um try to grab five to maybe ten pieces of paper and a bunch of tape we want you guys to build a um build a tall sculpture that represents your faith we want you guys to be creative with 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 your sculptures and kind of have um yeah be creative with it uh we're, we're there's, no wrong, there's no there's no wrong sculptures to build uh, as long as it to you represents your faith uh that's perfect so we're gonna give you guys five minutes um so pause the video again and make sure to set a timer for five minutes and then come back once once you're all done and pause all right welcome back uh i hope you guys' sculptures are standing tall standing strong uh, so we're just gonna ask you guys a couple questions. These are just to think about. These are just kind of, uh, you know, just to kind of get you thinking. So, the first question is: How easy was it to create a sculpture that represented your faith? Um, was it easy? Was it difficult? I know for me personally, it was when I did this. It was kind of difficult. I didn't really know exactly what to create. I didn't really know how to put my faith into a sculpture of paper and tape. Um, I created a cross. It took me a little bit longer than five minutes, but uh, I mean, some of you might say that it was kind of easy. Some of you guys might have known exactly what you wanted to represent, kind of known exactly what you wanted to build, and you know that that's awesome. And so, how was it creating a sculpture? Like, how was creating a sculpture like trying to describe your faith to someone? Uh, I think trying to describe my faith to someone might have been it was probably a little bit easier. I'm able to use my words. I'm able to explain things. I'm able to, to do all of that. But, you know, some of them are, it could, they could both be difficult. They could both be easy, but, uh, but yeah. So now what I want you guys to do is, this is going to hurt a little, but I want you to look at your sculpture and I want you to take two hands and I want you guys to just destroy it. Just, just, just destroy it. Get rid of it, break it, tear it up, do whatever you need to do. Okay, I'll give you guys 30 seconds to do that. Pause. All right. So how did you guys feel when you ruined your sculpture? I mean, some of you might have been angry, upset, maybe confused as to why I asked you guys to do that. And here's, here's, where, here's what it's about. Just as easy as it was to, to, to destroy those, those sculptures, I mean, they're made of masking tape and paper, so it was pretty easy. But just as easy as it was to destroy those, many Christians' faith are easy to knock down and destroy because they're just as weak, because they haven't been given the proper building blocks, and they haven't been given the, the, proper, the proper base and the proper structure to, to withstand the destruction that is trying to be to be done every day all day so just as just as the sculptures were kind of easy to knock down i mean they're made of masking tape and paper uh you know many christians faith is, is easy to knock down as well it's easy to destroy as well because of a weak foundation because of a weak base of their faith so today we're going to discover how to create a solid foundation of kind of you know what we believe because the more you know what we believe, the easier it is for you to defend it, the easier it is for you to continue believing what we believe when you have a solid, strong base and foundation. So if you guys were at camp last summer as well, uh, we did talk about this kind of with um, our Jenga blocks. I don't know if you guys remember those. So our whole theme last summer was about the creed, right? So we built 
uh, the, the, the Jenga blocks with certain terms or beliefs that we share as Orthodox Christians, right? And if we had that sturdy base with everything that, that, that's in our creed, um, all into that one, uh, the, the one Jenga tower, right? It was very sturdy. But if we took one or two pieces out of it, or we, we kind of tore it down, because there wasn't um, everything wasn't in there, it was kind of a weak foundation, right? So everything was able to kind of topple over a little bit easier. Um, so it's it, it's very important that we understand what we believe as Orthodox Christians. Um, so one of the big things that a lot of people don't understand, I know I didn't I didn't understand a lot until I kind of like prepped for for this lesson, was a lot of the differences between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Um, so it's very important for us to kind of understand the, the, the differences between orthodoxy and Catholicism. Uh, many Roman Catholics don't necessarily see a major dividing line between us, um, but, but many of them see uh, the differences as what they would call like a kind of form of legitimate diversity. Um, this is within the holy tradition of faith and practice established by the apostles and their su successors as the, the Holy Spirit shaped the human expression of the Christian church in, ortho, uh, in different lands um, with di different peoples and cultures. We kind of talked about this last year as well. We as Orthodox Christians can actually not officially call other Christian teachings and practices heresies. This is because we've had no ecumenical council for nearly 1,200 years, which is the only authoritative forum uh, which that can declare doctrine and, and a heresy for the church. They're the only legitimate uh, say for that. So in effect, how we currently treat Catholics and Protestants in, in respect to forbidding them to partake of the church's sacraments, of, of communion and, and, and Orthodox marriage and all of those, um, this, this shows that we understand them to be outside of the visible, visible church kind of as we understand it. Uh, so yes, they're Christians, but they're outside of the Orthodox Church. Uh, and so while Catholics have changed their practice toward us and would allow us to receive Holy Communion from them, we are strictly forbidden to do so. As receiving their communion would mean that we are in full agreement with all of their different doctrines and practices. However, the, the Orthodox Church sees some differences. There, there are definitely some differences between us and the Catholics that uh, us as Orthodox Christians, we see a little bit too far gone from our church and too far removed from our church that we can't call ourselves in communion with them. And so uh, our stand of prohibiting non-Orthodox from receiving our Holy Communion seems very strict, but this has actually been our consistent practice ever since we were instructed to do so actually by the apostles themselves that walked next to Jesus. So it was actually back in Jesus' time that this teaching was, was instructed, and we just haven't changed it ever since. And so that's So in the church, there has been unity of faith, a legitimate diversity of, of theological schools with their own particular emphasis of stress to, uh, to Christian doctrine and practice. So from the start, Greeks and Latins had a preached the Christian ministry in their own way. The, the Latin approach was much more practical, uh, while the Greek was a little bit more speculative. Latin thought that, uh, the Latin thought was uh, influenced by more judicial ideas, by the concepts of the Roman law. Well, the Greeks understood theology in the context of worship, and especially in the light of the Holy Liturgy. So when thinking about the Trinity, Latins actually started with the unity of the Godhead, and the Greeks with the threeness of the persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which, which is a reflection of the crucifixion. Latins thought primarily of Christ as the victim of the crucifixion, but the Greeks actually thought of Christ the victor of the crucifixion, uh, the winner over the crucifixion. And then the Latins talked more about you know, redemption, while the Greeks talked about, about deification, becoming like God instead of being redeemed by God, such as the Latins, the Greeks actually talk more about becoming like God. Um, and so the, sc the schools of like Antioch and Alexandria with the East, 
these two more distinct approaches were not in themselves contradictory, but each served to supplement each other. They, they, they were working together um, and each, you know, had its place in the fullness of, of the Catholic church, of the Catholic tradition. Yeah. Um, so with that, we're going to kind of dive into some of the main, main concepts and kind of how we kind of differ. Um, so for instance, um, with God as God and the Trinity, um, we believe that um, they're all, th so the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three, three separate, but also the same person. Um, it's a tough concept to understand. Um, it's not really meant to be fully understood. It's, we as humans kind of struggle to comprehend it because it's not something for us to comprehend. We just kind of have to accept it and have faith. Um, versus in the Catholic church, um, they kind of look at it as um, it begins with uh, the unity of the, the, the Godhead. So they actually added in the, what's it's called the filioque, which is the word and the son, which is to the creed. So um, their creed has those words. It's basically virtually the exact same as ours, except that they added this and the son. And so adding that takes away from from the unity and the sameness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they separate the Father and the Son a little bit more than what is held to be true in the Orthodox faith. So that is one of the major differences of the Orthodox to Catholicism is that filioque, uh, that and the Son phrase in the, in the Creed. Yeah. Um, and then another difference that we have is... Um, god as or christ as god and man uh, we emphasize the resurrection versus so during during easter our main cell celebration is that he rose from the, the 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 dead that's like our huge our big like point like that's 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 the whole reason is that christ came back from the the the, the dead and conquered it and saved us so we 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 look at, at christ as like a victor as um as like this this savior versus the catholic kind of view is it emphasizes the cruz cruz depiction so theirs is kind of they they emphasize a lot more of um he suffered for us um so they they kind of view him more as like christ is more of like a victim so because of us christ had to die and suffers on the the cross to save our sin or to to, to forgive our sins yeah um, so that's also, if, if you look at Western iconography, um, usually when you look at iconography of the, cru the crucifixion from Western um, influences, you'll see a lot more of like an emphasis on the pain or uh, the, the, the agony of it versus if you look at ours, it's, like, it's kind of nonchalant almost. I don't want to say that like that's kind of like, it's not nonchalant, but like there's not really an expression on Christ's face. Um, it's more... We, we have more of like a emphasis on the resurrection part of it. Like he, he was crucified to get to the resurrection. If that makes sense. Yeah. And then talking more about the Holy spirit, the difference is uh, the Orthodox, you know, in the creed, like we were talking about with the filioque. So in the creed, the Orthodox creed says, uh, you know, the Holy spirit, the Lord creator of life who proceeds from the father. However, in the, in the Catholic creed, it says, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so the Orthodox, we believe that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all together. However, in the Catholic Church, they believe, like we were talking about earlier, that, the, uh, that they say that the Father and the Son downplays the role of the Holy Spirit in the Church, especially until recently. And with that, we will conclude our first episode. Um, thank you guys for watching. We will close with a prayer and we'll see you guys at our, uh, on episode two of, uh, materialism. So Nick, do you want to close us out with a prayer? That'd be great. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I thank you for the time we had together. I thank you for allowing me and Owen to, to speak to these campers and anyone else watching. Uh, please allow them to heed our words, understand us, and use what our teachings, use the teachings of the church to the betterment of their souls and to lead 
them and everyone around them to salvation. Through the prayers of the Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you guys on Thursday.